to machine design course, we are going to move to a new topic, static failure theories. So, so far, we have studied the fundamental of stress, strain uh, theories, but now we want to use those topics and the fundamentals in developing theories and see when the part will fail. Okay. So the title of this section is Static Failure Theory because loads will be static and there will be some other theories for the dynamic failure theories. Those are for dynamic loads and uh, this is basically a different chapter of the book. This chapter represents overview of the fundamentals of static failure theories for ductile and brittle materials as well as fracture mechanics. So, so we're going to basically develop theory for both ductile and brittle materials. Uh, they are slightly different and we will discuss that during the course. Parts fail because their stresses exceed their strengths. So we've seen that. Okay, so we've seen that for the tensile stress and we know that when the part uh, basically endures the stress more than the strengths, then uh, it starts to yield and go to the plastic more, mode. <clears throat> and we call it for the tactile material failure because we don't want to have a permanent set and change in the shape of the material. So it depends in the material in question and its relative strengths in compression, tension, and shear. Um, so ductile and brittle materials are slightly different and we know that brittle material don't have that uh, plastic region and they go to sudden fracture and we call it failure for the uh, brittle material, sorry. And for the ductile material, uh, uh, permanent plastic deformation is a failure for us. It also depends on the character of the loading, whether a static or dynamic, and on the presence or absence of cracks in the material. So, so far, uh, we haven't discussed that much about cracks. Uh, we had cracks in a stress concentration and we explained that how cracks could develop or increase uh, stress intensity and uh, they could cause failure but uh, we will open this uh, this discussion more in this chapter okay so figure a shows the stress state in a tensile test specimen. So we had this uh, more circle many times in the past. Uh, we know how to draw this uh, uh, more circle for the tensile test specimen. The tensile test slowly applies a pure tensile loading to the part and causes a tensile normal stress. So here you see principal normal stresses are sigma 1 and uh, sigma 3 and the maximum shear stress is tau 1 3 which is uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2 or sigma 1 divided by 2. However, the more circle shows that the shear stress is also present which happens to be exactly half as large as the normal stress. Okay, so uh, tau 1, 3 is equal to sigma 1 divided by 2. Now we have another more circle. Figure B shows the more circle for the stress state in a torsion test specimen. The torsion test slowly applies a pure torsion loading to the part and causes a shear stress. Again, we had this uh, plot many times in the past. If you don't recall how to plot these more circles, please go back to the section, uh, review the more circle and see how you could draw them. Uh, 
but for the pure torsion test, we know that we apply the tau xy, this is applied stress, uh, and that also is equal to the, to the maximum shear stress. <clears throat> okay, and principal normal stresses are sigma 1 and sigma 3, and they are located in a plate 45 degrees from a maximum shear stress. However, the Morse theory shows that the normal stress is also present, which appears to be exactly equal to shear stress. Okay, so this sigma 1 and sigma 3 are not applied stresses. Okay, they are not in applied um, stress element or that cube element for the stress. You don't see that on that cube. But if you just rotate the plate 45 degrees, you will see that there are some principal normal stresses, sigma 1 and sigma 3. So those stresses exist in the part. Same here for the tensile test specimen, yes? Um, for, the, for the applied coordinate systems and plates, we don't see any shear stresses but once we rotate 45 degrees we see that those shear stresses or principal shear stresses exist in a part but just in a different direction in general ductile isotropic materials in static tensile loadings are limited by their shear strengths while retail materials are limited by their tensile strengths so it means that the tall material like uh, like steel or aluminium, uh, they are more sen sensitive to shear stresses, and that's why shear strength is the cap for their uh, endurance capability, let's say. And uh, brittle materials are more sensitive to tensile stresses, and that's why tensile strength is more important for them. Okay. Um, Therefore, different failure theories exist for the two classes of materials, ductile and brittle. A part may fail if it yields and distorts significantly to not function properly. Also, a part may fail by fracturing and separating different mechanisms behind each of them. Okay, so uh, as, as I said, uh, for the ductile material, yielding and distorting uh, could be counted as a failure. But for the brittle materials, we have a fracture and separation. Um, and of course, there is a different mechanism behind them, okay? But we call it failure anyway for both of these cases. Only ductile materials may yield significantly before fracture. Brittle materials proceed to fracture without significant shape change. Okay, um, so we know this fact. We uh, already discussed it before, but again, we don't want uh, plastic permanent changes or set or deformation in uh, the tall material because that machine won't be operational and the the shape of the material will change, um, so we call it failure. The tall materials will fracture if statically stressed beyond their ultimate tensile strengths. Their failure in machine parts is generally considered to occur when they yield under static loading. Okay, so failure is equal to yielding. Another significant factor in failure is the character of loading, whether it is static or dynamic. Okay, but the topic of this, uh, this uh, session, this video, is static uh, forces and the static loads. Uh, and we're going to develop static failure theories. But quick static load, the dis, uh, a distinction between ductile and brittle materials failure behavior blurs 
and the all materials fail in a brittle manner. Okay, we'll discuss this in more detail in the next chapter, but for now, it's good to know that um, in dynamic loads, a ductile and brittle materials will behave almost the same, and they will be uh, they will behave very similar to a brittle material. Failure of ductile materials under static loading. Several theories have been formulated to explain the static failure. The maximum normal stress theory, the maximum normal strain theory, the total strain energy theory, the distortion energy theory, and the maximum shear stress theory. So you see that uh, many theories have developed for uh, for materials under static loads, and we're gonna discuss few of them, which are the most significant one and important one in this uh, lecture and course. Of these, only the last two agree closely with experimental data for ductile materials under a static load, the von Mises theory is the most accurate one. Okay, um, so the distortion energy theory uh, is just another name for the von Mises theory, okay, which is the most accurate theory for ductile material, and also uh, the maximum shear stress theory also is a uh, uh, I could say it's quite accurate, um, it's handy, and it needs uh, less computation or calculation. Okay, we'll discuss these theories in coming slides. The one misses or distortion energy theory. The microscopic yielding mechanism is understood to be due to the relative sliding of the material's atoms within their lattice structure. So again, um, just look at the overall picture where we are, we are discussing first the tall material, we'll go later to the brittle materials, but for now we are developing theories for only the tall, the tall materials, and um, load is static, okay? So, is uh, basically this bullet point says that based on the um, many basically empirical data and experiments before, uh, they found that the mechanism be, be, uh, uh, the mechanism uh, which supports yielding, okay, it's mostly because of sliding materials atom, okay. Mm -hmm. This sliding is caused by shear stress and is accompanied by distortion of the shape of the material. Okay, so it, it's quite intuitive. Uh, it's understandable that why uh, sliding of atoms should happen because of shear stresses, because shear stresses normally will cause sliding, yes, not compression or tension. Um, like normal stresses, shear stresses cause sliding. The energy stored in the part from this distortion, distortion energy, is an indicator of the magnitude of the shear stress present. So we want to know how much shear stress present in the whole part, and we need to have one indicator. Okay, so it's like the thermal, thermal energy, yes? So let's say we want to find how much thermal energy exists in a part. We need one indicator, and that indicator is temperature. Okay, so here it's a very uh, similar, I could say, analogy between that these two examples here. We want to find out how much shear stress we have in the part, and to find this one out, we get help from the energy stored in the part from distortion. Okay, why we want to do that? Because 
we think that sheer stress is the main reason for the failure for the yielding in the tall material so we are looking for an indicator to see how much shear stress exists in the whole part total strain energy the strain energy u is a unit volume associated with any stress in the area under the stress strain curve up to the point of the applied stress as shown in figure for a unidirectional stress state. So this graph stress strain, it's uh, familiar to you, uh, is basically a tensile stress or unidirectional stress state. Uh, we already discussed this, that how we could find the uh, strain energy um, stored in the part, but strain energy density, yes? strain energy density why because we have an epsilon here okay if it was force and deflection uh, then it was a uh, strain energy or energy but since this one is stress strain this is a stress energy density assuming that the stress strain curve is essentially linear up to the yield point then we can express the total stress energy in a unit volume at any point in the range as u is equal to uh, epsilon uh, sigma divided by 2 or sigma epsilon divided by 2. Okay, we are interested in the linear part for the ductile material because as we said, <clears throat> above yielding is failure. We don't care. Uh, above the yielding okay we are looking to develop a theory to see when the part fails before the yield point okay so you might say we already know that for a unidirectional stress state we don't have to develop a theory which is true because we know the part yields at the yield um, strengths Okay, but what about for multi-directional stress state? We still don't know that, and we we are interested to develop the theory for a general case. Okay, extended this to a three-dimensional stress state gives u is equal to. Uh, 0.5 multiplied by sigma 1 epsilon 1 plus sigma 2 epsilon 2 plus sigma 3 epsilon 3. So these are a normal, uh, principal normal stresses and principal normal strains. Okay, so let's say we have a multi dimensional uh, stress tensor. What we need to do first, we need to find a principal. Um, a, a principal uh, a stress tensor okay so once we have that tensor which is a diagonal tensor and the off diagonal elements will be zero or basically all the tau x y uh, tau x z tau z y all of these uh, uh, components are zero then we could simply find the uh, a strain energy density using the principal stresses and principal strains that can act on planes of zero shear stress okay so um, it's just basically definition again for the principal stress and principal strain uh, coordinate systems we know that on those coordinate systems there is no any uh, shear stresses those will be zero okay so based on the Poisson ratio uh, sigma 1 is uh, 1 over e multiplied by sigma 1 minus nu sigma 2 minus nu sigma 3 um, the reason basically we want uh, these equations because 
we want to eliminate sigma from uh, this equation and uh, we want to express it totally uh, based on a stress <clears throat> okay so now total stress uh, sorry total strain energy will be e is equal to 1 over 2e multiplied by sigma square plus sigma 2 square plus sigma 3 square minus 2 nu multiplied by sigma 1 sigma 2 plus sigma 2 sigma 3 plus sigma 1 sigma 3 but nu is a Poisson's ratio okay so just a reminder for example for a steel nu is uh, something between 0 0.25 to 0 0.3 okay it's a constant and e is the young's module so these are material properties uh, e and nu and these are principal normal stresses that we could find based on Moore's circle hydrostatic loading very very large amounts of strain energy can be stored in materials without failure if they are hydrostatically loaded to create stresses that are uniform in all directions so what is hydrostatic load is simply when you uh, 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 put the part uh, in inside let's say water or oil or any other liquids okay uh, so when you let's say put the part one meter below the surface in the water in a tank water water tank and then um, the, the load will be hydrostatic okay so that hydrostatic load change the volume of the part but doesn't distort it so the shape won't change for example, uh, let's say you have um, um, let's say you have a cube, okay, or let's say you have a, a sphere, okay. So that is sphere, if you put it uh, in one meter, okay, deep into a water, the volume changes, but it will stay sphere. If you increase the depth to 10 meter, okay, volume uh, will decrease, but it will stay again sphere. So uh, hydrostatic loads basically will co won't cause any distortion, and uh, only changes volume. And we said that distortion only happens because of shear stresses so it means that in hydrostatic loads we don't have shear stresses so parts won't fail in hydrostatic loads and only they will experience some volume changes in hydrostatic pressure um, sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 and is equal to sigma h what is the sigma h for example is that uh, pressure of water okay in general cases uh, the sigma hydraulic okay not the hydrostatic cases okay so in general cases hydrostatic stress is the average of all principal normal stresses so it means that if uh, we get out that stress from the strain energy then we could see what portion of that energy is because of the hydrostatic load and what portion of that is because of the non-hydrostatic load which create distortion and failure so this can be done in compression very easily by pressing the specimen in a pressure chamber okay so we discussed that if we put a part in the pressure chamber then we'll have a hydrostatic many experiments have shown that materials can be hydrostatically stressed to levels well beyond their ultimate strengths in compression without failure as this just reduces the volume of the specimen without changing its shape so you see even for i don't know ductile materials um, the ultimate tensile strength is not a, a limitation or a cap um, we could increase the pressure 
well beyond that ultimate tensile strength, but the part doesn't fail at all. Components of strain energy. So now we want to see what components you have. The total strain energy in a loaded part can be considered to consist of two components, one due to hydrostatic loading, which changes its volume, and one due to distortion, which changes its shape. Okay, um, so we are interested in the distortion part. So U uh, is equal to UD, U of distortion, plus U of hydrostatic. And we are interested in UD, which is equal to U minus UH. The distortion energy then could be calculated by this equation. UD is equal to 1 plus nu divided by 3E multiplied by sigma square plus sigma 2 squared, sigma 3 squared, minus sigma 1, sigma 2, minus sigma 2, sigma 3, minus sigma 1, sigma 3. If you are interested to see how this distortion energy uh, is calculated and drive, refer to these pages of the book, but it's quite easy. You already know that what is the sigma H or sigma hydrostatic, so you could find a UH, and simply you could subtract UH from U, and find UD. Distortion energy in tensile test. The distortion test is a uniaxial stress state where at yield, sigma 1 is equal to SY. What was SY? Yield strength. And sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 and is equal to 0. So uh, based on the previous formula we developed that was a general distortion energy. If we use, we use that, then we could find what is the distortion energy at the failure or at the yield point for the tensile test. Okay, now, uh, now we have that indicator. We have that indicator that shows what level of distortion energy could cause failure. So failure happens when the distortion energy level reaches to the tensile test level. So this is the tensile test level, and this is the general case, yes? Now we know it for, for the 3D case, when we have sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, uh, we could find SY, or the yielding strength, equal to this formula. So now we know that for uh, multi-directional cases or 3D cases, when a combination of these sigma causes uh, this equation to be equal to sigma y or more than sigma y, failure happens. For two-dimensional cases, simply we don't have sigma 2, sigma 2 is 0, and sy will be equal to square root of sigma 1 square minus sigma 1, sigma 3 plus sigma 3 square. So this is a basically conclusion of this uh, part and we want to see how we could now use this uh, final basically equation. So first let's discuss two-dimensional case. The two-dimensional distortion energy equation describes an ellipse which when plotted on the sigma 1, sigma 3 axis is as shown in figure below, the interior of this ellipse defines the region of combined by axial stresses safe against yielding under static loading. So this was uh, the basically equation we developed and uh, this is a basically a, a principal normal uh, stress coordinate systems for two-dimensional cases, sigma 1 and sigma 3. And you see that this y is equal to the basically square root of this equation. So uh, uh, when the failure happens, is y is equal to 1. Okay, so you see that this is a basically ellipse formula. Okay, so if we divide the stress by sigma y, then 
we will have this ellipse. This is the border of the failure and we are safe inside this region. So it means that when, let's say, um, sigma one is here now in this ellipse, here at this point, it's one, okay? It's sigma one divided by SY and same as here. And um, if we fall into this region, this ellipse region, then failure won't happen. So this line here, this, uh, let's say X axis or horizontal axis shows load line for a, a pure tensile test. Okay, for pure tensile test, sigma three is always zero, and we have some value for sigma one. So um, when we start to load the part, sigma one is zero, then in the tensile test, we'll increase sigma one, increase, increase, part doesn't fail, part doesn't fail. We are still in the linear uh, region, in the elastic region, okay, until we reach to the ill strengths or we reach to the SY. At this point, the part will fail. Okay, why? Because it goes to the plastic region. It goes to the plastic region. Now this is the line for pure torsion test. For the pure torsion test, we know that uh, sigma one is equal to minus sigma three. Okay, um, so at the beginning, when we apply the portion, uh, torsion torque, uh, we are at the origin, we increase the torsion torque. So sigma one and sigma three both increases, increases, yes, until we reach to the border of the ellipse at this point, and then the part fades. Okay, we'll discuss where this formula came from, okay, in the um, coming slides. One misses effective stress. It's often convenient in situations involving combined tensile and shear stresses acting on the same point to define an effective stress can, that can be used to represent the stress combination. The one misses effective stress is defined as the uniaxial tensile stress that would create the same distortion energy as is created by the actual combination of applied stresses. This approach allows us to treat cases of combined multi-axial tensile and stress uh, and shear stresses as if they were due to pure tensile loading. So here we have the effective one misses the stress for the two-dimensional cases. Sigma prime is the one misses effective stress um, you see uh, the analogy and similarity between uh, this formula and the formula that we developed before. If expressed in terms of the applied stresses, uh, then for the two dimensional cases, sigma prime will be equal to this expression, okay? So these are exactly the same, okay? It's just this one is based on applied stresses and this one principal stresses up to you which one you, you use, uh, you will end up with the same sigma prime. So when sigma prime reaches to the yield strengths, the part yield or uh, fails, and uh, when the sigma prime is less than SY, we are okay. Safety factor, or N, is equal to SY, divided by sigma prime, okay? So again, when sigma prime is equal to SY, safety factor is equal to one. When sigma prime is less than SY, N is more than one and we are safe. And we said that safety factor should be always more than one. A stress for the two dimensional cases, um, again here, we are using a formula for the sigma prime. They are exactly uh, the same formulas.
Okay, now uh, let's discuss the pure shear or pure torsion um, torque test. For the cases of pure shear as um, encountered in pure torsional loading, the principal stresses become sigma 1 is equal to tau is equal to minus sigma 3 and sigma 2 is equal to 0. The absolute values of sigma 1 and a minus sigma 2 at these points for the two-dimensional case uh, then could be substituted here in this formula and we see that sy square is equal to 3 pa max square okay and as then sigma 1 okay and so, n is equal to 3 sigma 1 square okay so sigma 1 will be sy divided by square root of 3 square root of 3 is, uh, uh, is equal to 0 0.577 so y is equal to tau max. So what does that mean? Okay. It means that when the tau max is equal to this value, failure happens, or safety factor is one. Okay. Or we are at the border of that ellipse that we already explained. This relation defines the shear yield strength. Okay, so we have now new definition here: shear yield strength of any ductile material as a fraction of its yield strength in tension S Y determined from the tensile test. Okay, so S Y S or yield shear yield strength is equal to 0 0.577 sy or 1 divided by square root of 3 sy okay so now we want to discuss the maximum shear stress theory. so uh, the role of shear stress in static failure was recognized prior to development of the one misses approach to the failure analysis of the tall materials under static loading. So, so far we have discussed that shear stress um, is the main reason of distortion. And before even the von Mises approach development, uh, we, we knew that, or they, they basically scientists knew that, a failure mostly happens because of those shear stresses. So that's why the maximum shear stress theory uh, developed. And that maximum shear stress theory states that failure occurs when the maximum shear stress in part exceeds the shear stress in a tensile specimen at field. Okay. So how much is the maximum shear stress for the tensile specimen at the yield. That is equal to half of SY, yes? This predicts that the shear yield strengths, shear yield strengths of a ductile material is SYS is equal to half of SY. Okay, so you see that slight differences between the maximum shear stress theory and the one misses theory now for the other one was SYS was equal to 0 0.577 SY. Figure shows the hexagonal failure envelope for the two-dimensional maximum shear theory superposed on the distortion energy ellipse. It is inscribed within the ellipse and contacts it at six points. Okay, so this is a basically that hexagonal failure envelope. Okay, that gray area, and is um, inscribed inside the ellipse. Um, so this is the difference between these two theories. Okay, the other one, the maximum shear stress theory, has smaller safe region. Uh, and the one missile theory has slightly bigger safe region. This is obviously, I mean, this is, it refers to the maximum shear stress failure theory. 
This is obviously a more conservative failure theory than distortion energy as it is contained within the later. Thus, conditions for torsional shear are shown at points C and D. Okay, so this is a load line for pure torsion, and you see that in one of them, failure predicted at this point, and the other one failure predicted at this point. Why? Because in uh, one of them, SYS is equal to 0.5 SY, the other one is equal to 0.577 SY, okay, slightly bigger. So it means that um, it's a very useful theory still. It's, um, it's simpler than Vomisa theory, yes, but it's quite safe and conservative, plus the computation is less. And uh, you don't need to calculate, let's say, effective on Mises stress. Safety factor for the maximum shear stress theory is found from this equation now. So safety factor is equal to SYS, which is shear yield strength divided by the maximum tor uh, maximum shear stress, tau max. SYS is equal to half of SY based on the maximum shear stress theory uh, divided by tau max. Tau max is equal to based on the Mohr circle, based on the Mohr circle, is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2, and then we have a safety factor based on principal normal stresses, sigma 1 and sigma 3. Okay, so the, the last uh, theory that uh, we want to discuss is the maximum normal stress theory, okay? And this, we are still in the ductile materials, okay? The maximum normal stress theory states that failure will occur when the normal stress in the specimen reaches some limit on normal strengths such as tensile strengths or ultimate tensile strengths for ductile materials, ill strengths the desire criteria. Okay. Um, figure shows the two-dimensional ferial envelope for the maximum normal stress theory. It is square. Okay. So you see that the safe region now goes beyond that the one misses the ellipse. It means that this theory is not a proper theory. Sometimes um, it doesn't predict the failure in this region. Okay, so in these regions, it shows that the safety factor is less than one, but uh, the reality is that one misses theory is the most accurate one, and uh, but the part fades. So why we are discussing this here? First, we want to see that this is a obsolete theory is it's old theory that is no longer in use uh, but is useful in brittle material that we will discuss later okay so for tactile material under a static load uh, we only use Vomisa theory and the maximum shear stress theory okay so let's finalize this uh, uh, discussion by one example, uh, which is a failure of a ductile uh, part, and this is example 5.1 of the book. So what is the problem? And we have a bracket here. Uh, we want to determine the safety factors for the bracket road shown in figure based on both the distortion energy theory and the maximum shear theory and compare them. What are given, we know the material is uh, 2024 T4 aluminum and the yield strength is 45,000 PSI. The road length L, um, the arm length is given. Uh, the road outside diameter, this D um, is also given and the, uh, the external force F is also given, which is 1,000 pounds. 
What are assumptions? The load is static and the assembly is at room temperature. Consider shear stress due to transfer loading as well as other stresses. Okay, so we want to uh, consider all kind of shear stresses. So we had this example before in a stress analysis. Um, we discussed it for both point A and B in in the base plane. Why? Because these are the most critical points and the stress is maximum at this cross section. Um, and that's why we have to investigate both on points A and B. These are uh, applied uh, stress elements for point A and point B. So you see at the point B, we have normal stress sigma x, which is equal to MCI, and at the uh, tau xz, which is a shear stress due to the torsion torque, is Ti divided by J. For the point B, we have uh, two shear stresses. We have a torsion torque shear stress, and we have the transverse shear stress. Um, um, so we will calculate them again here, but if you are looking for more detail, please review previous examples. First, for the point A, we need to calculate the sigma x. Again, this is a, a stress element for the point A. We have uh, sigma x equal to MCI, uh, and it is equal to uh, 18,108 psi, and tau xi, which is equal to tr divided by j, which is equal to, to 12,072 psi. Okay, so once we have applied the stresses, then uh, based on the Mohr circle, we could find principal normal stresses and uh, the maximum shear stress. So the maximum shear stress, which is equal to the radius of the Mohr circle, is calculated. Uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 all calculated. Again, we had this example before in more detail. If you don't recall the details, and you want to review, please back to those sections. But these values could be easily calculated by more circle. Okay, now we have principal normal stresses, then we could calculate a von Mises effective stress or sigma prime. So we have a formula for sigma prime, and we just need to substitute values for a sigma one and sigma three. And sigma prime will be equal to 27,661 psi. Okay, so again, we are in the point A still. The safety factor using the distortion energy theory or the von Mises will be N is equal to SY or the yield strength divided by sigma prime. We have both of these values. SY was given as a material property. Sigma prime we already calculated, and it comes to 1.7. So it means that the part is safe under this external load. Why? Because safety factor is more than one. It means that we are inside the one Mises ellipse. The safety factor using the maximum shear stress theory then is quite easy. And we had the formula N is equal to half of SY. The half, what is half of SY is basically the shear yield strength, okay, divided by the maximum shear stress. So we calculated the maximum shear stress previous slide and n will be equal to 1.6. So you see that uh, the maximum shear stress theory is more conservative. Why? Because safety factor we achieve here is less than the safety factor based on the von Mises theory. Now let's see that inside the ellipse, okay, what is our load line? We have sigma one and uh, sigma three. These are the values already calculated in previous slides. Um, 
So we see that if we divide them by um, if we divide them by SY, then we could find the values here on the X axis and Y axis. Okay, so if I locate sigma one, sigma three point here, it will be here. Okay, and now just I need to connect the origin to this point and this will be the load line. What does that mean? It means that when the external force is zero, we are at this point. If we increase, increase the external force until we reach to 1,000 pound, we will reach to this specific point here. If we continue to increase that uh, external force, then we will reach to the boundary of the hexagonal and the ellipse. Okay, and these are the marginal points of safety where the safety factor is equal to one, and after that, the failure will happen, okay? So you see that again, uh, we will reach to the border of hexagonal, which is for the maximum shear stress sooner than the border of the ellipse. It means that the maximum shear stress is more conservative and is, I could say, is safer. Okay, so, now you learn how to um, find the load line and uh, you see that we are inside the ellipse so the safety factor should be more than one this is exactly what we predicted if you see a discrepancy between your plot and numbers it means that something is wrong um, for example if you achieve a safety factor less than one but um, you locate your point uh, let's say inside the ellipse, so it means something is wrong and doesn't match. Now we will continue for the point B. For the point B, we have two type of shears, a torsion and the bending. We need to sum them up and calculate them for the tau of bending. We have this formula for um, solid circular cross sections, 4V divided by 3A, and now we have the tau maximum. So for the point B, uh, the safety factor using the distortion energy theory is, uh, is equal, N is equal to SYS divided by tau max. Okay. Okay, so this is basically an alternative uh, solution to find the safety factor in distortion energy theory because we have a pure torsion in this case, I'm sorry, pure shear stress in this case, but um, you could simply use effective stress formula that sigma prime, I use the general formula for uh, a safety factor N is equal to SY divided by sigma prime instead of this formula, okay? But anyway, you could use this formula because we only have, um, we only have shear stress. So now it comes to N, it comes to 2.1 based on distortion energy or von Mises energy theory for the point B. The safety factor using the maximum shear stress theory N is equal to SYS divided by tau max. SYS in this theory is equal to half of SY divided by tau max, and it comes to 1.8. Okay. I strongly recommend you to um, again find the load line on a sigma one and sigma three uh, coordinate system and uh, basically pinpoint your applied stress um, on this coordinate system and see if you are inside the one misses ellipse or uh, the hexagonal. Um, but what you could see obviously here that safety factors are higher than point A. What does it mean to you? It means that A, a point A is uh, more critical or is the most critical point in this bracket. 